Welcome to the Momentum Ministry Partners podcast. This podcast is designed to provide momentum in our God-given roles of leadership as we partner together to equip today's Christian leaders for tomorrow's opportunities. Whether you're a pastor, youth leader, ministry volunteer, parent, or student, we want to be your go-to and most trusted resource for equipping and encouragement when it comes to your ministry and leadership influence. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to another Momentum Ministry Partners <laughs> podcast. Jeff Bogue is laughing. I'm gonna and see if I can make me. Eric laugh at this. Intro. He's trying to throw me off, off my game. Yeah, my name's Eric. I'll be your host today. <laughs> Jeff, how are you doing? Well, Eric, thanks for designing the world's <laughs> most uncomfortable podcast studio. <laughs> I'm just trying to shift around. There you go. Get the blood to flow just, to my legs. No matter what you do, keep the microphone in front of your face. Okay. that will be helpful. That's our listeners be good. will thank you. Yeah, how's that? <laughs> Oh my! Well, Jeff, we're going to talk today about parenting, and this is—I uh, was just telling you, this is like asking for a friend. I'm doing air quotes, asking for a friend. <laughs> I wrote a lot of these questions, but we've—we've—we uh, did one parenting uh, podcast. I think it's season one. Okay, uh, we got some good traction with it, but. Uh, Jeff, a lot of our listeners, uh, as I'm learning and getting to be out and traveling, are parents. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of parents uh, are pre-teens. They have pre-teenagers. So they're just getting ready to be in youth ministry. They're, they're just parenting get... pre-teens. They're, they're parenting pre-teens. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> That's probably there. a good... <laughs> That's probably a needed clarification. <laughs> oh, man. Did I say they're pre you said they're pre-teens. They're pre-teens. I'm like, oh, we got, that's a seems like a different conversation. That's a we, would very, need to- we have a very niche market <laughs> with the Momentum <laughs> podcast here. Oh, man. Yes, they're parenting pre-teens. Alliteration is hard. Um, so this conversation today, we wanted to, to just talk through this a little bit mm-hmm. and dedicate some time. Actually, on the very next episode, we're actually going to talk from a church side. How do you partner together with parents? So we're kind of pairing these two conversations up here. So tune in for the next episode as well. But Jeff, let's uh, dive into this conversation. My kids are are five and seven right now. So this is kind of a fun conversation to have. Uh, I'll let you share here in a second about the age of your kids. But Mm -hmm. one of the things that I love in ministry is getting to be alongside uh, families who are a little further ahead of you, even in ministry context, there, there's, you know, this biblical word called discipleship, where you can bring people along. Yeah, that you've like, hey, I remember this, and I, I learned this lesson during this season, and having somebody that's further ahead of you in that conversation is super helpful. Uh, so that's kind of what we want to set up here for this conversation. Uh, we're gonna talk boundaries, guardrails. We're going to talk consequences. Uh, we're going to talk how do you handle discipline. So that's a little bit of, of setting the table for this conversation. Share with us a little bit about your family dynamics, your kid's age, just for context sake. Yeah, so my kids are mostly adults now. We still Our youngest is a junior in high school. Um, so our oldest would be, uh, the, ra- the range right now would be 25 to 22, um, 20, or, or 22, 21, uh, our son's going to turn 20 here, and then 18 and 16 will be our range. So we have six kids, five boys and uh, our daughter, Naomi. And uh, yeah, and we had them close together. And so we, uh, that was kind of the plan, actually, was, you know, kind of do babies, do kids, do high school, and and then they're into adulthood, and uh, yeah, they're fun. They're the joy of my life, and uh, we have, we definitely have taken the parenting journey once or twice <laughs> yep. here. Um, but God's been grateful to us. My my big goal, our big goal, Heidi and I's big goal was uh, we want the kids to love Jesus, love us, and love each other. That was kind of the thing that we were looking for, and so we still measure the win that way and we're blessed that that has played out that our children uh, love jesus uh, love us and love each other um Mm. and then everything else kind of i think kind of comes out in the wash a little bit um uh and it's it's been it's been good fun yeah i love when when you're able to like uh 
pinpoint those things like in parenting i think sometimes uh, we would all know and understand like our role as a parent is to to be the primary disciplers mm -hmm. of our children and and when you think like ministry and church world sometimes you think like discipleship pathways and people can geek out on all that stuff but when you think parenting sometimes it gets muddy and unclear mm -hmm. i see a lot of parents right now that want to be their fr their kids friends yeah and and that can muddy the waters, especially in these conversations of like, how do you set boundaries or guidelines or consequences? And so Jeff, in this conversation, let's kind of dive into this. When your kids are at like, give different stages of life, uh, how do you set boundaries and guidelines for like the adolescence, the teenage years, and then even into adulthood? What does that look like? You know, I think... And these are my opinions, you know, and, and obviously I, I want all of my life and view of everything to be formed by Scripture. So um, Scripture and, and God's wisdom is a huge part of how we pursued parenting. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what I'm going to tell you is what we did, and to me that's opinion stuff. There's lots of different ways to parent. Don't at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, yeah, and, and there's lots of ways to tackle the same thing. But so I would say this, I, I think what happens in parenting that is very, very hard um, in the middle of it. When So when the kids are babies, everything is just like, make sure they, you know, can function the next day, you know, uh, get them to sleep, burp them, feed them. It's actually the most simple parenting the hardest thing during that stage of parenting is not the child, it's you. Mm. And what what has happened at that point is when you have a child, your life is forever changed. And the hardest struggle at, at that phase of parenting is not that, you know, your your kid doesn't obey you or whatever, because they, they just lay there, you know, and smile and th those kind of things. The hardest thing is your lack of freedom, mm. uh, the fact that I, I always uh, say, uh, you can stay up all night playing video games if you want as a young parent, but you're getting up at 6 a.m. <laughs> like, that's yep. the way it is. So it's your lack of sleep. It's the change in your marriage and your relationship with your, your wife and your husband because mm. neither one is the primary focus anymore. The child is the primary focus. Uh, it's the it's the shift in responsibility. Like I need to grow up, and like this impulse buy or this impulse trip or this lack of discipline in my schedule. You know, I thought I was going to be there at five, but it's really seven thirty. All that has to go away because you have to support this little life. Mm -hmm. I remember so clearly when we brought our first son home, our oldest son, Josiah. Um, I remember leaving the hospital and getting in the car, and the thought that went through my mind was, so we just go? Like, there's no, <laughs> you don't get a license or a permit or a yeah. coach or something? But they're like, yeah, it, it was hard, literally, mm. it was harder to adopt a puppy than it was to go home with a human being. Mm. So that whole adjustment, and what I found is this, people who give way to that who look and say i'm going to i'm going to figure out how to be a great parent and to enjoy this and let the changes happen in my life and i would even say in my marriage that are just kind of natural going to happen they tend to enjoy it and tend to be relaxed and and tend to kind of fall in love with parenting a little bit people who fight that uh, you know, mom and dad are arguing about who gets a free night and is it your turn and did you do as much as I did? And then people who fight it in their marriage uh, who are like, well, we're, we still need to go away and have all of our romantic nights. I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not saying do away with that stuff. But I'm like, you better, you're in this for the rest of your life. So hanging on to your 20s. Yeah is not a real realistic possibility. And when you look at the break in most parenting relationships with their children, so the dad that disappears, the mom that's self-centered, um, what you're looking at is you're looking at people holding on to a selfish view of life because they're, they're scared to death that if they live in an unselfish way, they're going to be unhappy. 
And what I would say to you is, and I mean, I mean this lovingly, so please maybe trust my heart with it a little bit. That's a very immature thing. A very mature thing is to realize that happiness is defined a whole bunch of different ways. And there is a richness that happens um, in embracing uh, children in your life. Now, I still, like uh, a couple times a year, or actually maybe just once actually, I still go and do something that only I like to do. And I then like gift that back to Heidi. It, it, you don't kill all those things in your life or cut them all out. Yeah. You just balance them out and they're probably less frequent. But what you'll also find is like, I don't really want to be gone from my family. It is nice to have a day or two away. And then I tend to get lonely. And I'm like, I actually kind of want to go home, you yep. know? So I think when you first have a baby, and I know a lot of our audience is, is in that phase, like that's the big deal. Instead of saying, how do I hold on to my old life with a baby? The question needs to be, how do I invent and recreate a new life with a child? Uh, that's, a, that's a big thing. Mm. I think as you go forward then, um, I am a strong believer in, in not having a child-centric home. So our children joined our family and they joined our calling. Mm. They did not become the focal point of everything. And I think that's important. I think there's a thousand ways to go about pulling that off, but I think it's important that um, that they do that. So when our kids were little, I was a youth pastor back when our kids were first born, most of them first born. Uh, like our oldest son, Josiah, I think he was five days old. I took him to a high school with me to do a, a gospel club. I'm like, well, this is what, you know, I talk, he can't understand me, but I'm like, this is what we do, bud. Yep. You know, um, my kids uh, always went to church with me when they were older. Like I couldn't bring an infant. He Heidi and I would kind of divide and conquer a lot in, in our parenting. Mm -hmm. But when they were five, six, seven years old, they can, they can sit for 45 minutes to their Sunday school class while dad... So we made little fun things. They would go with me. We would get bagels. They thought that was the greatest thing ever. And then they would hang out, and I would be like, "Guys, go check." I I have I have yet to ever check my children into children's ministry. I'm like, "Go check yourself in and bring me the sticker." You know, nice. everything. So they were kind of church rats, but mm -hmm. they had fun with it. Um, as they got older, this would be like probably seven, eight, nine, ten. They would actually travel with me. And I was just talking with them about this the other day. They, they brought it up. Um, it was a treat, because I'd only take one of them uh, to most things. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a treat, and they knew whose turn it was, et cetera, et cetera. But they were joining what our family does. I wasn't stopping and saying, oh my gosh, what's your next need, and how do I get the crust off of your peanut butter and jelly? And because of that mindset, our kids were pretty independent. They were teasing their younger brother, uh, our youngest son, Eli, when he was five, six years old, he would get the griddle out and make pancakes. Mm. And I'm like, because like, he's like, I'm hungry. I'm like, well, come here. Let me show you how to, how to <laughs> yeah. eat. Our kids, um, our, our kids probably couldn't tell you uh, when, so, uh, that Heidi, I think, as soon as they could reach the washer and dryer, taught them to do their own laundry. And so it, because we're not child centric, yep. but I think our kids would say the place my dad wants to be the most is wherever we are. Mm -hmm. He wants to be with us. He enjoys us. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not, uh, I'm not going to sit there and do all your homework. I'm going to teach you how to study and research. Uh, I'm not going to play every game with you. You're going to go make friends and do and I think a lot of what I see now, you can call it helicopter parenting. I always joke that we were kind of free range parents, um, but we we did not hover over our kids. We did not dote on them, but we loved them and loved to be with them and they loved us and loved to be with yep. us. So yep. those are kind of the beginning yeah. things I think that yeah. framed a lot of 
yeah. the, the parenting in, between mm. Heidi and I. That's super good, Jeff, because um, for one, I think when you have six, you know, the youngest are kind of raised by the village. So that's yeah. uh, a well, fun... They always, <laughs> the, the kid, we call our oldest son third parent. There you go. And the kids were much more afraid of him than uh, he, <laughs> Heidi and I. The thought for, for Bethany and I of being outnumbered is terrifying. So I think we're, we're stopping it, too. We have a boy and a girl. We're good. Yeah, uh, here's what I always say, guys. Don't first of all, everybody listening, don't be weak. Like you, you want that, but once three is a major transition, it really yes. is a major transition. People think six is a lot, and it is, I guess. But what I say is, once you go from man to man to zone, it's all just versions of zone. There you go. You know, it's not it's not as hard as people think it is. There you go. Well, that's probably a good perspective. Some that I'll never have. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, I think in this, like, the the hard part is, like, uh, there's a lot of, like, discipline and there's different style, parenting styles. There's different perspectives. Nowadays, you can go on YouTube and watch a video on how to discipline your child or how to provide consequences. Like, w- what are some of the things that you found most helpful when it comes to, like, setting up consequences like hey i know we've talked even on the podcast like one of your big things is like we're not going to lie to each other yeah like as you put those things in place and you saw that play out probably every child is different you have to think through you know the the differences in that but beyond that like what factors do you consider in that process of like uh doling out consequences or discipline for for your children the so what i would encourage you to do is this I would discipline by category, not by circumstance. Mm. So we set in three categories that you were always going to get in trouble for. Um, You were going to get in trouble if you defied us, because if you won't listen to mommy and daddy, we can't protect you. And that's all the way through teenagehood. You defy Mm. us, you're in trouble. Now that wasn't an ego thing. It right. wasn't like I'm your father. You know, it was if if you if you won't listen and cooperate with me, I can't protect you. Mm-hmm. And if I can't protect you, that means I I'm unable to trust you. Mm-hmm. And now I have to control you. Mm-hmm. So you're going to get in trouble for defiance. Mm-hmm. Uh, lying was a big one for me um, and Heidi because what we said was uh, people who love each other don't lie to each other. So if you did something, tell us the truth and we'll work it out. Yeah. Like you might get in trouble for it, but you're going to get in way more trouble if you lie. So we tell each other the truth. Now the reason that that was a big deal for me was actually because uh, it was more for when the kids got older. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to lie to me about pornography and lie to me about your struggles and lie to me about your mental health. Right. Tell me so we can actually have a real conversation and have real help in that. But I have to train that into a a child. Mm -hmm. And then any kind of like uh, physical harm, like you you, you clock your brother in the head, Uh, people who love each other don't physically attack each other. Right. (laughs) You know, kind of thing. Beyond that, Mm -hmm. um, most of what, what the kids did circumstantially either fell into one of those categories or frankly, it was funny. (laughs) <laughs> so it was it was like they nobody at one time my son uh, our son Isaac climbed out his second story bedroom window and was on the roof playing the guitar and and a steep roof too at, at our old house and I'm like well I really never told him to do that <laughs> that he couldn't do that he wasn't defying me right he didn't lie about it he's not hurting anybody so now it's like a hey bud like maybe this isn't it's that's not a discipline situation right. it's an instruction situation mm-hmm. and there would be lots and lots of that like mm-hmm. that i think a lot of parenting is that um the the child uh melting down at the end of a Dis- day at disney world is not a discipline situation that's just a kid that um needs to take a nap now he melts down, screams at his brother, and hits him. Now we're talking discipline, right? right? So we would, we just kind of picked categories. Mm-hmm. The way that Heidi uh, would say it, I always thought was really, really helpful. When kids were little, she, what she would say is, uh, you need to teach a child to obey you the first time. Mm-hmm. That way I can protect you. 
Yep. You know, so when I say put your toys away, that's a that's an important thing that you obey me so that when I say stop a car is coming, you have the same trained response. And then the lying stuff was I want I wanted to train my kids to be transparent. Like mm -hmm. come to your father with a problem. Yep. Don't lie to me, don't keep secrets. I'm very aware that um, my kids did things and made made mistakes, did honorary stuff that I don't know about. I'm not naive about that. But I'm also very aware that when they were in trouble, they came to me. Yeah. They're, they're like, Dad, I'm in trouble right here. Yeah. And, they, and they still do that. Mm. And then like, I want you to love each other. So when we get mad, we don't clobber our brother with the, with the Wii controller. Right. You know, that, right. that kind of thing. Then the way that we would discipline um, is this. Um, I think you can time out. I think you can take things away. I think you can spank. And I spanked my kids when it was appropriate, usually one of those three things, but this is the way that I did it. I got spanked when I was a child, but my father was a first-generation Christ follower. He spanked in anger, and I was leery of that. Like, my dad would kind of whip his belt off, snap it, and then spank us, yep. you know, kind of thing. Now, I knew he loved me, mm -hmm. and the couple of times he got carried away, he apologized to me about that. So we like, it was fine. What we did was I wanted the mechanism for spanking to not be easily reached. Hmm. So we had a, we called it the rod. This is the old King James says, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. So we called it the rod and it was two commercial paint stirring sticks duct taped together. It's a great paddle. <laughs> we kept it in the kitchen. And so when there was a, a time that we needed to spank, uh, we would talk to them, et cetera, like figure out, you know, what the, mm. uh, we, we, I calm, we calm the situation down. We tried never to do this in anger. Yeah. And then I would say, you need to go get the rod. Well, I can tell you right now, the walk to go get the rod was way worse than the pain inflicted by the rod, <laughs> you know? So they, they, that was like torture yep. kind of thing. This is what I think, though, whether you're timeouting, you're um, uh, taking things, you're grounding, you're spanking. By the way, I think spanking should stop by the time your kids hit double digits for sure. It's, yep. it's a child mechanism. Yep. I, I'm making a number up right now, but like 10 and up, you shouldn't be spanking your kids, right? There, there's different disciplines there. But um, this is what I would say. Um, Discipline needs to be clear, it needs to be consistent, and it needs to be costly. Mm. So in my thinking, and Heidi's thinking, if, if we didn't come into this situation to have a bad night, and we didn't come into this situation because we just really love spanking or we really love discipline our children, so you escalated this, and the point of discipline is not retaliation for what you did. The point of discipline is training. And part of that training is that the cost of this discipline isn't worth the benefit of what you did. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. going to hurt. Um, the, the, uh, we, we never threatened our children like it, we, if we said you're gonna get a spanking, you were gonna get one. Mm -hmm. We tried not to over spank. So the, am I gonna spank a two year old differently than an eight year old? Of course I am, right? right? And then there's the personality of a child. Yep. Some of our children, um, you barely touched them and it broke, the, it broke their little willful spirit mm -hmm. and that's all they needed. Others, my one son, I'm pretty sure, doesn't feel pain. <laughs> he's still kind of like, he's an adult right. now, but I, I, yeah. I watch him hurt something or run through somebody on a basketball court. I'm like, do you, are you neurologically okay? <laughs> like, you don't feel pain, right? Uh, so, but it needed to cost. So later, mm -hmm. I'm taking this from you, and you are going to sit in your room while the family has the movie night we had already planned to have. Right. Can I come out now? No. Yep. You cannot. Yep. Uh, can I come? No, and if you ask me again, it's going to be longer. So just stop it. 
yeah. the cars taken yeah. away, those kind of things. But I think it's got to be it's got to be consistent and it, and it's got to be costly mm. and it's got to be clear. Mm. Why did I just get in trouble? Yeah. I never I don't think I ever had a time where the kids were like, "Why are you spanking me?" You know, I'm like, "No, we we yeah. had already talked about it." Yeah. Calmed it down. Um and I think that's that's mm. a big deal. I I personally do n- I don't believe in reasoning with my kids. Um, I do not, um, I didn't believe in uh, compromising with my kids. I mean, there is a right, there is a wrong. Well, just because you say, okay, if that's just because I say, that's the way it is. Right. And so there's a a loving, strong Mm. element to discipline. Mm. Yeah, Jeff, I like that because a lot of this is couched in, I'm, I'm your parent and I'm here to help you. I want to help you learn how to navigate the world, relationships, independence, being responsible. Um, even what you were just saying there is kind of like following the law of natural consequences. Yeah. If I can't trust you to be kind to your sister, I, you can't go to the birthday party because I can't trust you to be kind to your friends. That's right. If if you won't if you won't obey me, you're not mm-hmm. going to obey your youth pastor. Yeah. And and I would I would say Eric like these ugly nights were these were rare hmm. Be, because we were clear consistent and it was costly mm-hmm. um most of the time our children listen to us i also think it's important you know i, I pe- we get a lot of compliments from our children and i always am careful with that hmm. and i tell people my kids make me look good hmm. And they make me look good because they chose not to rebel. It's not because I parented them perfectly. Mm-hmm. They made a decision along the way that they were going to cooperate in this process. All I did was try to steer them back on course. There's other parents that have tried the exact same thing, and their kids, as soon as they're on course, will grab the wheel and you know go mm-hmm. off the cliff with it. So you can't control them. Right. Um, I just, we tried to have a loving environment mm. that was clear, consistent. You're going to get in trouble every time you lie to me. Right. And it was costly. Like, if we're going to go here, we're yeah. going here. And yeah. we're not going to enjoy our time here. Yeah. You know. Mm. So in that in that preteen stage, when your kids are that age, not you as the parent, <laughs> when you're... When your kids are in that age and you're trying to figure out how to clearly communicate expectations, what does that process look like? Obviously, there's there's givens where the, your kids are going to bring you those things, but in the the things like you you mentioned earlier, pornography, or like, hey, like how do you broach those subjects? How do you or even like you know you said the one son got out on the roof, like with the things that you know are clear, do this, don't do that. How do you articulate those? Is that like a family meeting? Do you have a list? Do you have them listed on the wall? What does that look like? It, it's Deuteronomy. It's as we go, okay. right? And so, like the the first time you you're four years old and you tell me you didn't eat the candy, the first time you lie to me, that's when we're going to have that conversation. And the the consequences for that lie are going to be different than for the fifteenth lie that's down the road, right? Yeah. So I wanted to train you in those yeah. things. Uh, obedience has to be trained because when I say uh, clean your room, a child has to know what that means. Like what do, what does mommy mean when she says, so so we may have to go in as a mom and dad and like show them, like your mm-hmm. toys go here, you, you know? So you're, yeah. you're training them. Uh, when we say later on, it's like when we say uh, drive responsibly, right what what does that what does yep. that mean but it starts with yeah. high control so for yeah. instance um when i'm teaching my kids to drive uh heidi and i both do this we sit in the car for the very first time and i say to them okay the number one rule of the car okay i'm going to give you this rule and i'm going to give you this rule because auto accidents are the number one killers of teenagers so what you're going to do is the most dangerous thing you're ever going to do, and yeah. you don't know how to do it. I'm like, are we clear? I won't mm-hmm. even let them start the car yet. Right. 
So I want I want them to have a fear of yep. this machine. Yep. Okay, got you, Dad. So here's the number one rule right now. Whatever I tell you to do, you do it and you do not question me. So you do it instantly and you don't question me. Yep. Um, and and I kind of get that mm. it's a high control mm. because we're in a high place. So right. when just you just take that one makes sense to people. Yep. Just take that, that where the where our kids grew up. We had a pond across the street. Number one rule: you cannot go to the pond without mommy or daddy. Right. Because pe- people drown in the pond. And you cannot go fishing, you cannot go swimming, you cannot go throw rocks. You cannot go there unless mommy or daddy is with you. If they did that, there was a severe consequence yep. because the consequences of disobedience are so severe. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. So our son on the roof, that there was never clarity. Right. He, he was being a kid. Yeah. And, and he was, if you know him, he was very much being himself. Mm-hmm. Now, he wasn't thinking that if you fall off of a roof, it'll right. kill you. <laughs> right. So that is like a, hey, don't do this again yep. uh, kind of a thing. Go up in your tree house or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you ha- I think you have to train. Mm-hmm. And then you, you this is where I, I would suggest, like you train by category. Yeah. Not by circumstance. Mm. So when I'm training my our, our kids to drive, I'm not saying when you reach when you get to this intersection, look this way, that way, that way, that way. I'm teaching them awareness. Mm-hmm. I'm teaching them by category yep. to yep. to function a certain mm. way. But you're going to have to show them at first. They don't For know. sure. And that I think is huge because at every age, at every level, and stage and season. <laughs> You, you are the parent, you need to model this to them. Because uh, like my son, just he's in second grade, he got off the bus early in the school year. Dad, the bus driver said, uh, we're not allowed to say bad words. And he's innocent. He goes, I don't know what they are. He's afraid. I'm, yeah. I don't want to say a bad word because I don't want to get in trouble with the bus driver. You tell him Chicago Cubs, Chicago so- Bears. <laughs> So I'm like, he's genuinely asking me after school and Bethany was not home and I'm panicking. I'm like, (laughs) but like, we don't say, we don't swear around. We don't swear around him. I have swore out (laughs) honest confession, but I'm like, I don't, I don't want to model that for him. So he doesn't know what bad words are. Yeah. So I, I like took a, a deep breath and I listed them all off. I mean, I'm like, he's genuinely asking. He doesn't know. Yeah. So I told him what they are and said, buddy, these are bad words. And I don't think he's like going to the bus the next day telling his buddies, hey, I learned what they all are. He gent- his heart is sincere. But now when, you know, I say something that I shouldn't or mom does or whoever, he knows. Yeah. He knows when the TV show, like he heard on the radio, the dad, that guy said a bad word. I'm like, yes, he did, buddy. So like, I like that you have to model it. Too, because if I go around saying all the things that I told him not to say, yeah, it, it doesn't work. Yep, it's it, counterintuitive. Well, I th- I just think walking with them and finding ways to I like I, I think Hi- my wife Heidi is incredible. With this she would say, uh, I bet you she said a hundred thousand times, "Hey, let me show you something." You know, and she would show the kids, and yep. and they they got to where they thought it was fun and this mm-hmm. and that. And but we said that all the time. Mm-hmm. We also put in values like uh, my kids weren't allowed to say I can't. Like I very very sh- strong about that. I love that. I'm one. like you're not yeah. allowed to say I can't, and they would get in not in trouble trouble, but I'd be like they'd say I can't do it. I was like that's not an answer. You're not allowed to say that. You're allowed to say I don't know how. You're allowed to say I need help. Mm-hmm. But you're not allowed to say I can't. Um, and then I would do things with. I know this all sounds a little bit silly, but like when they were little, you know, we'd be unloading groceries from the back of the suburban. <laughs> and um, think of like a three-year-old. Well, I would make them carry the watermelon into the house, and they would say I can't. I'd be like, you're not allowed to say that. And so they would. They figured out that they could roll it across the garage floor, <laughs> yeah. and then they would say, 
I can't get it up the steps. I'm like, not allowed to say that. So they figured out how to like walk it up the steps. Then they'd roll it through the kitchen, and then they would say, I can't get it on the counter. You're not allowed to say that. And they would say, can you help me get it on the counter? I'm like, there you go. Like yeah. I, I, That one is over your head. Yeah. But we, I may not carry the milk or whatever. <laughs> because I'm just like, I don't, we're not going to have a defeatist attitude. Yeah. You're not allowed to be raised that way. Mm-hmm. Well, now as a, as a dad, when they get all of my tools and decide to build their own go-kart with, <laughs> like, I have to, I have to be like, well, I'm the one that told them they right. could do stuff and like, <laughs> Where are my tools? And I guess we didn't need that vanity anymore, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. The wheels are off my lawnmower, you know, that guy's. But I, I like like it and love it. And and I look back and I'm like, my mom and dad let me do that all the time. I was always building something, yep. making something, losing dad's tools, mm-hmm. and he never got mad at me. I think he he was he liked the ingenuity yeah. and he liked, and I would entertain myself with it. Mm. Well, now I see that my own kids do this. I'm like, this is, mm. this is great. You That's know? That's awesome. Yeah. I, I love the, that, like, you're not allowed to say I can't, we've been using that. And I'm trying to even implement the phrase, like, I haven't learned that yet. Like, I just haven't learned how to do that yet. Yeah. So we'll help you learn, but give yourself some grace. You haven't learned how to, how to do that yet. So yeah, well, in, a, in a in a culture that is often paralyzed by anxiety, depression, mm-hmm. and fear, yep. um, these attitudes are important. And mm-hmm. and I would say this: that is easier taught with a father in the home and a set of parents that are focused on parenting, not focused on peace. Mm-hmm. And so the. Um, I, I think sometimes uh, mom and dad get upset that an eight-year-old's upset with them. And I think you have to, to a little bit, like, like uh, you know, your eight-year-old's upset with you. It's almost like, so? I mean, what, what do I care if an eight-year-old's right. upset with me? And I don't mean that like in an abusive way. I mean that literally in like a social way. Yeah. And sometimes we, we're looking for too much of our needs to be met. Mm. Uh, too much peace is what I see a lot. Like mm. life is stressful and it's difficult. Mm. It's easier for me to cave in than to, than to push through. That stuff will only come back to bite you in the end. Mm. And, and so it's a, it's a short-term solution that, that turns into long-term misery. Yeah. This is where what I mean by embracing that parenting. I'm coming home. I enjoy my family. I can't wait to see them. They make me laugh. But I'm not like going off the clock. Right. As they get older, sometimes you get common interests. Like my uh, my boys love the NBA. I'm like, well, this is nice because I don't really want to talk either. So we watch the <laughs> NBA. Um, and, and our daughter has interest in kind of a little bit of everything. It's funny, like she got an interest in arranging flowers. Hmm. And so we often have these beautiful flowers. I'm like, well, this is nice. You know, yeah. like, when they were little, I needed to play with them and wrestle with them and, and all those kind of things. But we would have, I'm air quoting also, I, we'd have devotions every night, hmm. which was a set of DVDs that I found that told Bible stories. And we'd be like, let's have devotions, kids. And it was the kids and daddy having devotions, and I would wake up <laughs> right after Daniel got out of lion's den. You nice. know, I'm like I'm so tired, but we still got that time. It was meant to be quiet, hmm. so you learn all these little tricks For and sure. stuff. But it's mostly fun. Yeah. I I think parenting is a lot of it is just enjoying your kids and enjoying yeah. the phase of life that you're yeah. in. Well, Jeff, thank you for this conversation and just sharing your heart and. Uh, for me and all the others who uh, our children are younger and not yet into the teenage years, this is super helpful uh, just to kind of get a look into the future and what lies ahead uh, in the next episode that we're going to do uh, that will air next week. We really want to help uh, think through the other side because maybe you are in that season of life where, where parenting is really hard and you're really stuck and you need some help. Uh, and so we're going to talk on the ministry side of that. How can a church come alongside and help partner with parents 
in a positive way. So uh, tune in next week for that episode and that conversation. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in to this discussion. Uh, we hope that this has been a benefit and a value. Uh, like always, if you have any follow-up questions to this episode or others, or if there are topics that we can be of a resource to you, send those to us. We'd love nothing more than to help point in the right direction. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We hope you found it to be valuable. And if you did, would you share it with someone else in your network who might enjoy it? Also, would you please go on and subscribe, rate, and review it? That way you don't miss any more and somebody else will be able to find it too. Also, because we want to be your trusted resource, if you have a question or topic that you would like us to discuss on an upcoming episode, send that to us via email to info at buildmomentum.org or you can send us a DM on any of our social media platforms. You can find us there at Momentum Ministry Partners. Also, if you need more information on our ministry, be sure to check out our website at buildmomentum.org. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you next time.